And it's going to be our last week focusing on the life of Jacob. Next week we're going to shift to studying the life of Joseph, which is one of the most incredible accounts of all time. Don't miss it. You're going to be so blessed by his story. And we'll be starting Joseph next week. But first, back to our boy Jacob, whose life we've been studying for the last several weeks as we've made our way through Genesis. He obeyed God's command to leave the place known as Haran and head back home. But he did not obey God's command to go all the way back home. He just partially obeyed. He didn't go all the way back home to where his family were, where the others, other believers were. Instead, he settled in pagan territory. And for years, it seemed like everything was pretty much just going fine. And then one day, it all came crashing down at once. We learned last week about how his daughter, Dina, was tragically raped by the most prominent man in the area, And two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, hatched a plot for revenge that resulted in them killing every man in the whole town, after which the rest of Jacob's sons showed up and pillaged the town like common thieves. And now after not walking with the Lord, not having a relationship with God for 10 years, Jacob has turned back into his old cowardly self and his only concern after all this had happened was that the other men in the area in the region were going to band together and come after them and probably try and kill all of them. Specifically, he was concerned about himself. And that's where we pick things up today. So if you're here and your life is messed up and your kids are weird and people are trying to kill you, this is just the Bible study for you today. Well... All the important events in today's study are going to be centered around a place known as Bethel. And if you've been with us through our study of Genesis, you know that Bethel is a place in Israel of great importance to Jacob. It's where he met the Lord for the first time. It's where he had his salvation experience. He was fleeing for his life from his brother Esau who wanted to murder him for conniving his way to the birthright that should have belonged to Esau. He was also going to try and find a wife for himself among his family's people in Haran. He'd been sent on this journey alone by his parents with pretty much no resources, no security, no money to speak of at all. And in Bethel, this place, close to the end of his journey, God came to Jacob in a dream, in a vision, the famous ladder or stairway to heaven. Never mind. And in Genesis 28, we read about how Jacob was given a glimpse in this dream of the spiritual reality all around him. And he saw angels descending from heaven to the earth and then returning to heaven. And then the Lord himself called out to Jacob in that dream and promised to bless Jacob. And when he woke from that sleep, Jacob exclaimed, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. How awesome is this place. This is none other than than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And so he set up a pillar, a monument, and he pledged his life to the Lord, and he named the place Bethel, Bethel, which means house of God. But as we said earlier, Jacob has not been walking with God for around a decade at this point. And one of the themes of today's study is going to be Jacob returning to Bethel. So we're going to take a look at this question of How do we come back to God when we've spent a time period walking away from him, not walking in relationship with him? How do we come back to God and what should we expect when that happens? And before we dig into the text, I want you to tuck one thing away in the back of your mind and keep this just tucked there through our whole study today. I want you to notice that nowhere in this whole chapter is God ever going to condemn Jacob for walking away for the past 10 years, not even once. The Lord will not mention it. He won't bring it up. He won't say, you're kind of done, Jacob. You've messed up too badly. Why? Why? Because when we belong to Jesus, all of our failures and all of our sins are covered by what Jesus did on the cross. And when God looks at us, he sees us in light of the cross where we were given the righteousness of Jesus. So he doesn't look at our record and say, okay, how many sins do we have? When he looks at us, he literally sees the record of Jesus, which to this day and for all eternity will be 
zero sins. An infinite number of days since our last sin because it's never, ever, ever happened. He sees us as spotless, blameless, holy because we have the righteousness of Jesus that was given to us when Jesus died on the cross. Now, does that mean that we we never talk about our past failures, mistakes, and sins with God? Not at all because we still need healing from our past. We still need restoration. We still need deliverance. We still need to be counseled by the Holy Spirit. We need that. God doesn't need it. He's forgiven our sin. He's forgotten it. But but we still have scars and pains that we need help working through. And God, through the Holy Spirit, which is known as the Comforter, is there to help with that. But God never brings up the past to condemn us. Ever. Ever. The cross has taken care of our sin Completely. So write this down. It's the first fill in on your outline. The Lord does not condemn Jacob or me for past sins and failures. The Lord does not condemn Jacob or me for past sins and failures. Because what does Romans 8 1 say? It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so with that, Let's jump in in Genesis 35, verse 1. Get your pen ready. We're going to be underlining something, especially in verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, now arise, the rest of verse 1 here. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And so Jacob's in a pit of his own making. His family's fallen apart. Terrible things have happened, all because he didn't go to where the Lord told him to go. But the Lord shows up and says, arise, I'm calling you out of this mess. I'm lifting you out of this, Jacob. That's just what the Lord does. He doesn't show up when we're in a pit of our own making and say, man, that's a really big hole you've dug yourself into. That looks terrible. Have a good one. Think about what you've done for a while. He doesn't do that. He just calls us up, calls us out of it. And now for the third time, if you're keeping track, the third time now, it takes the threat of death to get Jacob moving to where God wants him to go. Isn't this unbelievable? Once again, you'll recall that he only left home the first time because his brother Esau wanted to kill him. He only left Haran because his uncle Laban wanted to kill him. And now he only leaves Shechem because his son's killed all the men in the town and he's afraid that all the other men in the region are going to get together and kill him. Sometimes we're just flat out stubborn and things have to get pretty bad before we start obeying the Lord. It seems like Jacob was like that. So the Lord waits until Jacob's decisions create some terrible problems and then he calls Jacob to obey. The Lord waits until Jacob is at that point of desperation because the Lord's trying to make a point? No, because the Lord is waiting until Jacob is actually ready to listen. Because most of the time when we're not listening to the Lord, when we're doing our own thing, we're not ready to listen to the Lord when he says, you should come back to me. Things are gonna get bad. We go, no, no, it's gonna be fine. And it takes all the way up until things actually start getting bad that we begin to say, You know, Lord, there might be something to what you've been saying this whole time. And so the Lord's been waiting for Jacob to get to that place of desperation where he's ready to listen. And he finally does. He finally begins to obey the Lord. Why did things have to get that bad before he would listen to God? Because sin is pleasurable for a season. The Bible tells us that. It's pleasurable for a season. And as we said, it's usually only when the consequences of our sin start showing up that we start listening to the Lord. For about 10 years, it seemed like everything was going fine for Jacob. Settled in Shechem, moved into the culture, no problems yet. And then it all came crashing down at the same time. And what God wanted Jacob to do is he wanted Jacob to physically move. He wanted him to geographically relocate his entire family. It wasn't a small thing. Likewise for us. Sometimes the only way we can really return to the Lord when we've been living away from him is by making a move and and changing our living situation. You know, if we're living with someone that we're romantically involved with but we're not married, we can't stay in that situation and return to the Lord. We got to move. Something's actually got to change. You might have to move out of that situation. You might need to leave that relationship. 
There are actual moves that have to be made sometimes for us to return to the Lord. And guess what? Generally, we're very, very resistant to that. We're very resistant to changes like that, which is why things usually have to get pretty bad before we'll actually start listening to the Lord. Jacob's not that different to you and I. He's not that different at all. He's stubborn just like we are until the consequences of our sin begin to show up and we get a little more desperate. So like Jacob, you might need to change your living situation and location in order to return to the Lord. So write this down. If we're living in a sinful situation, we will need to move in order to truly return to the Lord. If we're living in a sinful situation, we will need to move in order to truly return to the Lord. You know, if you're working at McDonald's and you're serious about losing weight, you might have to make a move, right? I don't know how you're going to do it. You can't be there flipping the greatest fries on planet Earth and trying to lose weight at the same time. It's just not going to happen. You're sabotaging yourself and you got to be honest. You got to be like, I got to go work in the produce department of a supermarket. I got to do something because if I'm going to make a real change, this is not going to work. You can't stay in a situation that's guaranteed to cause you to sin more and at the same time say, but I'm coming back to the Lord. I'm returning to the Lord. It's, it's just not going to happen. Now for anyone though, for anyone who's been apart from the Lord and desires to return to walking with him, return to a relationship with the Lord, the Lord tells Jacob to do three specific things. Three specific things. And these are helpful to any of us or to anyone who desires to return to the Lord and says, how, how do I start? How do I start coming back to the Lord? He gives Jacob three things to do that are going to help restore his relationship with God. So write this down. The first one is, is get to church and stay there. Get to church and stay there. He says, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Go up to the house of God and dwell there. If you're going to get serious about your relationship with God, then you got to get yourself to where his people are gathering. you got to get together with other people who love him. you got to get yourself to church. It gives you a weekly opportunity to, to take communion, to worship with other believers, to study the word, to be challenged and convicted by the Holy Spirit, and to be encouraged and built up in your faith. Don't ever forget that the person who invented the church was Jesus Christ. Jesus invented the church. That's how important... He thinks it is. It was his idea. Jesus died for the church. That's how important he thinks it is. And if we love Jesus, we'll do what he's asked us to do. And he's asked us to be a part of the church. And you might say, what can once a week do? But you know what? The kind of person who says, what can once a week do is the kind of person who will end up doing nothing for months. Because once a week is a heck of a lot better than doing nothing for months. So it builds in this weekly flow into your life where every week you're going to have this chance. You're going to have this call to come back to the Lord. This call to worship the Lord. This call to get into the word of God. To get around other believers. It's incredible what God can do through that. He's asked us to be a part of the church. And please note that God's command to Jacob was not to get to the house of God and make a guest appearance every now and then. He didn't say, Jacob, go to Bethel once a month. He didn't say, Jacob, I am calling you to go to Bethel on Christmas and Easter. He said, I'm calling you to go to Bethel and dwell there, dwell there. Listen, it doesn't even have to be this church. I don't know why in the world you would go anywhere else, what might possess you to do that, but I feel like I have to tell you, it doesn't even have to be this church, but it has to be a church. It has to be a church. You have to find the house of God that you're going to dwell at. You have to. Secondly, God says, Jacob, I want you to get involved with making church happen. He says, make an altar there to God. Get involved with making church happen. God doesn't say, hey, Jacob, I want you to go to Bethel and just just get your butt on a rock somewhere around there. Just grab a seat, take up some space. Jacob, I don't need you to sing. I don't need you to lift your hands. I don't need you to clap. I don't even need you to pay attention during the Bible study. I just, I just need you to be present, Jacob, in Bethel once a week for about an hour and a half. No, the Lord says, he says, get involved. He says, build an altar. Get involved in worship. Take initiative. Build the place of worship by engaging your body, your mind, and your spirit in service and in worship. So if you want to get serious about your relationship with the Lord, 
you got to come to church ready to worship, ready to worship. Not like I am so ready to worship. I mean, as long as the worship set's good. I am so ready to worship as long as the sound mix isn't too loud or too soft. I'm so ready to worship, man, as long as nobody cuts me off on the way to church. Come ready to worship and to bless the Lord. Show up hungry to hear the word of God. And if you need to find a place to serve in the church, do that so that you're part of building the house of God. If New Hope is your home church, you're not serving anywhere, start doing it. Just mark the box on the back of your connection card, drop it in the black box today. Start building the house of worship. If this isn't your church, find a church if this isn't going to be it and serve there. Get involved in building that church. God told Jacob, make an altar there to God. And then thirdly, if you want to return to the Lord, make a note of this. God tells Jacob to remember God's past faithfulness. Remember God's past faithfulness. God says to him, God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. He says, remember, remember I showed up when you were in your lowest, worst place, Jacob. I've been there for you. Don't forget my faithfulness to you. Begin to remember all the times you've heard from the Lord in the past. Begin to Recall all the times you felt his presence in a powerful way. All the ways and times he's been faithful to you and taken care of you in the past. All the good things he's done for you. Because nothing builds faith in the present like remembering the faithfulness that God has shown in the past. Nothing builds faith in the present like remembering the faithfulness that God has shown in the past. And even today, after this message, as we pray, worship, and as we take communion, let me encourage you, just thank God for his faithfulness to you. Begin to think about the things he's done for you. Begin to list them. And as you do, you will literally feel your faith increasing and strengthening. In Revelation chapter 2, many of you will remember this from our study, Jesus writes a letter to the church in Ephesus and he famously says these words, they're on your outline, he says, you have left your first love. So what does he want them to do about it? He says, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. That phrase first works just means the things you used to do. Jesus says, Remember what it was like when you were walking with me, when you were close with me. Remember when our relationship was intimate. Now remember the things you were doing at that time. Remember how passionately you were worshiping, how involved you were at church. Remember how you were into the word of God. Remember those things and start doing them again. And that's what the Lord is working in Jacob's life. He's starting that process by saying, Jacob, step one is we got to get you back to Bethel we got to get you back to the start where we first met. Let's read verse 2. It says, And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then, underline, then let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me in the way which I have gone. Do you see what's already happening? God has triggered in Jacob's mind all the ways he's been faithful to him in the past. And now even Jacob on his own is starting to remember. He's telling his family that I'm going to go to Bethel. I'm going to worship God. Which God? The God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. His mind is starting to recall this. But notice that God doesn't say, hey, Jacob, clean up your life, clean up your family, then touch base with me again, maybe I have a calling for you. No, he just just calls Jacob in the messed up state that he's in, and all that kindness and grace, it does something inside of Jacob. It, It creates a desire in him to get the junk out of his life and family. He's, he's beginning to remember all the faithfulness of God. And what does the word say? It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's good. And so what happens here is after a long time of not tasting the presence of the Lord in any way, Jacob suddenly gets a taste and he goes, God is so much better than everything else. Everything that I've been involved in these past 10 years, I forgot how much better God is than all of that. He's better than anything. And and out of that desire, experiencing the kindness and goodness of God, just that taste of God, Jacob now says like, 
We got to get rid of all this stuff. This, this stuff is useless. What are these little idols that we've been worshiping? What have, we been, what have we been doing? Get rid of this. It's not because God says, do that and then I'll accept you. It's because God says, hey, come. Come just the way you are. And that just blows Jacob away and everything else seems so worthless in comparison. Knowing that we're going to the house of God, knowing that we're going to Bethel helps us to stay focused on living for the Lord. Because at Bethel, at the house of God, if we're not living for the Lord, the Holy Spirit tends to talk to us about it. He tends to convict us about it with the kindness of God. Because we get together and we, we sing about his goodness, we read about his grace in the word, we're reminded of his mercy at the table of communion. As Romans 2, 4 says, it says, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Write this down. God's goodness motivates Jacob to confront the sin in his life and family. God's goodness motivates Jacob to confront the sin in his life and family. He just gets a taste of God and suddenly realizes how worthless everything else is. Verse 4, so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods, the word there is literally idols, which were in their hands, they're those little idols, and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them or buried them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. So now in this culture, um, some of you will be aware that they had this class of people known as bond servants. It was essentially indentured slavery. And the way that you would mark who was your bond servant is you would pierce their ear and put an earring in them that would denote your ownership of them. It would show who their owner was. And so what seems to be the case here is that both men and women were earring, wearing earrings that in some way indicated the pagan god that they were serving. It was their way of saying, this pagan god is my master. So as the whole family begins returning to the Lord, they take off these earrings and they, they get rid of them. They bury them along with the idols and they leave them in Shechem, the place that they're turning their back on now because their master is the Lord. They're making that decision. And as their sins and mistakes and idolatry was, was buried at this tree, our sins too were left dead and buried at the foot of another tree, at the cross of Calvary. And that's what we remember every time that we take communion. We remember that our sins were left there. They were dealt with there. They are dead and buried. Thank God for that. Verse 5, and they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Again, how is there not a Christian band called the terror of God? That's just a freebie right there. Just had that thought right now. So they journey. And, and what we see here is we see that now that Jacob is moving in the direction that God has called him in, suddenly God's presence and protection begins to return to his family. Nobody lays a finger on him because God is doing something. God is making them all afraid of Jacob. This is something that had been missing on Jacob's family in Shechem. Nobody was scared of them in Shechem. But now that he's moving back in to the will of God, God's presence and protection shows up again. Verse 6, so Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And so the Bible just seems to want us to notice that when Jacob returns to Bethel, he uses all of his influence to bring everyone that he can with him. He doesn't say we're going to Bethel. Why? Well, it's kind of a private, personal decision I've made. He makes sure that everyone in his sphere of influence and in his household knows what he's doing and why that they're going there to serve the Lord and he wants them to come with him. He invites and brings as many people with him as he can. Verse 7, and he built an altar there and he called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. So Jacob has an epiphany. This is huge. This is huge. Don't miss this. He has a, a profound realization he reaches the area of Bethel and he builds an altar there to worship the Lord. And he renames the place El Bethel. And you might be thinking like, is he a Mexican Hebrew now or something like that? No, that's not what's going on. El Bethel means the God of the house of God. The God of the house of God. And this is why it's so profound. After looking back on his life, after looking back on his journey, Jacob comes back to the same place where he met God, where he said, this is the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. But he says, no, 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 I've, I've, I've realized something. It's not about the place. It's not about Bethel. 
It's about the God of the place. It's about the God of Bethel, El Bethel, God of the house of God. For us, it's, it's not about church, it's about the God of the church. It's about the God who created the church as a means to bring us closer to him. For us, it's not even about the Bible, it's about the God of the Bible. It's not about the letters and words, it's about the God who reveals himself through those letters and words. He's who we're seeking as we study the word. It's not about fellowship. It's not about a few chairs set up in someone's living room in the middle of the week. It's, it's the God of the fellowship. The God who shows up when we gather in his name. And that's why you can't stop Christianity by making it illegal. You can't stop it by closing all the churches. You can't stop it by forbidding people from talking about Jesus in public. You can't stop Christianity because it's not about the religion, it's about the God of Christianity who cannot be stopped and cannot be contained. Jacob says, listen, Bethel is amazing, but it's not about this place, it's about the God that I met in this place. And he's been with me even when I've left here. It's El Bethel, the God of the house of God. And just a quick note to clear up any potential confusion when we go forward. Even though Jacob here calls the place El Bethel, it'll be referred to in Scripture as Bethel. It's talking about this place. Verse 8, now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Behuth, which means terebinth of weeping. Now Rebekah was Jacob's mom, so this would have been Jacob's nanny. This would have been someone very dear to him, someone who played a, a massive role in raising Jacob, a comforting presence from his childhood. And it would seem that when Jacob comes back into the promised land, he sends for Deborah, his nanny. He says, come visit, come stay with us for a while uh, as he gets close to where he, Deborah, would have been living, which would have been close to uh, Isaac, Jacob's father. And so he says, come, come live with us for a while. And she does, but then she dies all of a sudden. And Jacob is just heartbroken and he grieves and he mourns. And we're going to come back to why this is important in just a few minutes. Verse 9, then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And I love this because if you've been with us, you know this is not a new thing. This is something God has already said to him. God said this to Jacob back in chapter 32 on that night when Jacob wrestled with the Lord. And I love this because here's what's happening. Jacob's lost 10 years. He had that moment. God says, your name's going to be Israel. I'm going to bless you. Go back to your family. And he doesn't. He spends 10 years living in pagan territory, disobeying the Lord. And now he comes back to the Lord and what God is literally doing, he's saying, Jacob, we're going to pick up right where we left off. That's what we're going to do. Where did we leave off? All right, your name is Israel. And he gives this blessing back to Jacob and he says, let's continue our journey. No monologue about what a disappointment Jacob was. No, no diatribe about how could he waste 10 years. He just says, okay, you're back. You're back on track. Let's get moving. Let's get moving forward, Jacob. There's no time to waste. But don't miss this. Make a note of this. When Jacob moved back into the will of God, he moved back into the blessings of God. When Jacob moved back into the will of God, he moved back into the blessings of God. And we can struggle to grasp that this is what God is really like. When we come back to him after a season of rebellion or wandering from the Lord, you know, we, we expect that maybe he's going to be like a person would, like a spouse would. A little passive aggressive, a little guarded, a little look in his eye constantly reminding us of our failure. And that, that's not what he's like. The Bible says our, our sins have been cast into the, the sea of his forgetfulness. God willingly forgets our sins because they're taken care of. And so when he says he loves us, there's, there's no asterisk, you know, with a thing on the bottom of the page that says, you know, yeah, despite all that horrible stuff that you did. No asterisk. He just loves us. When he says he's for us, he's just for us. When he says he wants to bless us, he just wants to bless us. And when we come back to him, he just says, okay, let's get moving. 
I got a destiny for you. I got a plan for your life. We got a purpose. Let, let's get going with that, as incredible and unbelievable as that sounds. But Jacob had to make the change. He had to make the move. And when he made the move and got back into the will of God, started following the calling of God on his life, boom, he found himself back in the place of being blessed by the Lord. Just like that. Verse 11, also God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. Now just for some perspective, Jacob was about 105 years old. So when you're about 105 years old, you need God Almighty to be involved if you're going to be fruitful and multiply. Let's just put that out there, okay? God keeps going and he says, you're going to be a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body, from your family line, which is actually an interesting promise because at this time, the people of God have never had a king. There's, there's never been a monarchy. That would happen much, much later when Samuel anointed Saul as Israel's first king. Just a quick side note for you Bible students, any Bible nerds in the room. Now, if you were like me, you, you were raised in Sunday school, and the Sunday school explanation when Saul is made king is, you know, th this was just a terrible thing because God never wanted Israel to have a king. He wanted to be their king forever. But take note, take note that God himself here prophesies to Jacob that kings will come from his family line. So God had a plan to give his people kings all along. That was part of his plan. Now, based on other prophecies that seem to prophesy David, it would seem from the best we can deduce that David was to be the one that God had planned for Israel from the beginning. But they were impatient and the result was Saul the king that God did not desire to give Israel, but he allowed them to have because they demanded him. That would seem to be the idea. Just a fun note to talk about in your Bible studies. Verse 12, God keeps speaking and he says, the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. That's another big line when you talk, want to talk about who owns Israel. Again, we side with God. That's just our position, okay? Then God went up. He departed from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. That drink offering would have been wine, representing the blood of Jesus in Scripture, and the oil representing the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And those are the keys to Christian living. The power of the Spirit and the provision of the blood. The power of the Spirit to live the Christian life and the provision of the blood to cover all our failures along the way, past, present, and future. Verse 15, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. That statement is just, it's a flashback. It's a weird way of writing, but he's not naming it for the first time. That happened way back earlier, several chapters ago. But just to give you an idea of where Beth Bethel is located so that you know, it's about 10 miles north of Jerusalem. So it's pretty close to Jerusalem. Now, what had the Lord said to Jacob? He had said, go up to Bethel and what? Dwell there. Dwell there. In other words, go to Bethel and stay there, Jacob. Anybody want to guess what Jacob does? Verse 16, we read, Then they journeyed from Bethel. From Bethel. Jacob makes the mistake of once again venturing out of the Lord's will, away from the place of the Lord's blessing, and the result's going to be tragic. Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, once left Bethel because of fear and famine, and he went down to Egypt. And it would seem that Jacob actually leaves Bethel because of family. I want to suggest to you the reason he leaves is because of the death of his nanny, Deborah. Because when you read the text, that would seem to be the only explanation. And it would also explain why the Lord chose to include that detail, um, because otherwise there's no real reason to stick it in there. So, so why would his nanny dying make Jacob leave Bethel? I think it's pretty simple because do you know who likes change? Nobody. Nobody likes change. None of us do. And sometimes we, we struggle to deal with changes at Bethel, changes at or in the house of God. You know, it was just so much better when that family was here, when those guys were there. It was just so much better when we're meeting in that location or in that building or, you know, I don't like the change in worship style. I don't like the new singer or the new guitar player, the new sound system. Why, why can't it just be like it used to? Why can't we sing those better songs that we used to sing? Why, why can't it be the way it was before? Because things change. 
things change. Why? Because we're being changed. Even though nobody likes change, we're being changed, thank God, from glory to glory, the Bible says, by the Holy Spirit. God is not static. He is moving forward. He is moving us forward. We're all being grown. We're all being changed. And it's the immature believer who says, well, if my nanny isn't here, then I'm not sticking around Bethel. Because all the good memories I have here were when my nanny was still alive. If anything changes, I'm leaving this church. You know, my, my parents were always such wonderful examples to me in this area. We, we talk all the time. And, and they've ended up at some churches where I'm just like, guys, what, like, what are you doing there? You know, they've, they've ended up in churches where, you know, I've, I've said, you know, based on what you're telling me, I think, I think your pastor's just kind of checked out because he's doing missions trips like 10 months of the year. Does, does he really want to be a pastor anymore? And they're like, ah, we don't think so. But, and they'd always say, but this, this is where the Lord's called us to be. And I, I remember when I was younger just being like, what are you guys doing? Why would you stay there? This church is like a train wreck. What are you doing? But you see, the reason is that my parents were mature, and they are mature believers. They, they understood the question is never have things changed. That's never the question. The question is always where is God calling me to be? Where is God calling me to be? Write that down and we'll talk about it. The question is never, have things changed? The question is always, where is God calling me to be? The question is never, are all my preferences being catered to? The question is always, where is God calling me to be? That's the only question. And if God says, hey, I want you here in this church, or if God says, I want you there in that church, and it doesn't matter what's going on or what's been changed. The only thing that matters is that you stay where the Lord has called you to be. Don't leave Bethel. Don't leave the place of God's blessing. Don't step out of the will of God just because something has changed. It'll lead to tragedy, as we'll see. We keep reading, and when there was a little distance to go, to Ephrath, which means house of bread. It's another name for Bethlehem. Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Bethlehem is about six miles south of Jerusalem. And so the question is really, what is Jacob doing taking his heavily pregnant wife on a rough journey? What's he doing? He's not thinking straight because that's what happens when you step outside of the will of God. We've talked about this before. You can't even... Think straight because the Lord is no longer giving you wisdom because you've decided that your wisdom is better than his. You can no longer access God's wisdom and you begin to make foolish, costly decisions. Verse 17, now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also. In other words, don't worry, your son is coming out right now. And so it was as her soul was departing for she died that she called his name Ben-Onai, which means son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, son of the right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Do you remember when Rachel couldn't have children and she yelled at Jacob in Genesis 30, give me children or else I die. Do you remember when after a long time of waiting, the Lord finally answered her prayers and she had her first child and she named him Joseph, which means God will add or God will give me another. She said, okay, God, now give me another one. She couldn't even enjoy the miraculous arrival of her son Joseph because she was so focused on what she didn't have. She didn't have a bunch of kids. And here we see the tragedy of God giving her the answer to her demand. Give me more children, God. And it kills her. You see, it's a, it's a dangerous thing to assume that we know what's best for us. Rachel never stopped to ask, Lord, what are you doing in all of this? What's your will, God? Is there something you know that I don't know? Something you're seeing that I'm not seeing? It's far better to allow the one who knows everything and sees everything and knows the future to decide what's best for us. It's far better to offer a similar prayer to the one Jesus prayed on the night of his arrest when he prayed, Father, 
if it is your will, take this cup away from me. In other words, get me out of this situation, Lord. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, Jesus prayed, prayed, Father, I want to be out of this situation, but more than that, more than that, Father, I want to be in your will. So if me being in this situation is part of your will, that's what I want. That's the way to pray. Ask for what you want, but stay surrendered to the will of God. Desire the will of God more. Trust our Heavenly Father to do what's best for us. He knows. He knows. And thank God that he doesn't give us everything we've ever asked for. I've said this before. How many of us would be married to someone we thought was really cute in high school or junior high? Have you ever had that experience before where you see someone after like 20 years that you thought was just like the business back in junior high or high school and you're like, what was wrong with me? I'm so grateful that the Lord didn't give me everything that I ever asked him for. He, he gave me something so much better in so many different ways in my life. Well, I think we're overdue for some weirdness, so let's get to it. Verse 21. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land, Israel is now the name for Jacob, that Reuben, the oldest son, went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. So Bilhah was the maidservant of Rachel. Rachel is dead. And now Reuben, the oldest son, goes and sleeps with his mom's maidservant, who was sort of his dad's official side chick is the best way we can put it in this situation. So there's a couple of theories for, for what's going on here, what Reuben is doing. And let me just preface this by saying none of these are justifications. They're just explanations. What Reuben does is horrible, awful, sinful, and the Bible's clear about that. But there's some who, who feel that He may have been trying to take over his father's role as patriarch, as leader of the family. It was an act that was done by people in the pagan culture of that day. If a father was still alive and the son wanted to make a power move and show everyone that he was taking over the family, essentially, he would sleep with one of his father's wives. That would be a way to do it. You might recall from the life of David that one of David's sons actually does that later on when he's trying to take the throne from his own father. So, so it could have been that, that this is a power play from Reuben. But other scholars point out that, that Reuben's mother was Leah, the not so good looking one. And so when Rachel dies, the position of favorite wife now opens up. And perhaps it was likely and known that Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, who Jacob would have seen a lot of, would have moved into that slot of favorite wife. And so if Reuben slept with Bilhah, he knew that Jacob would never touch her again. That was what was going to happen in that culture. He's never going to touch her again. And it's possible that this was a move to set up his mother, Leah, to become the favored wife in the family. And that's what he may have been trying to do. But again, however you slice it, awful, heinous, sinful, terrible. And it's going to come into play later on in the book of Genesis, all the way later in chapter 49, because Reuben doing this is going to cause him to lose his birthright in the family. He's never going to be forgiven for doing this by Jacob. Now we keep reading, and it says, Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, so Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, or joined his ancestors, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now we're not actually going to study through chapter 36 this week or next week. You're free to do that on your own time. I have no doubt there's some treasures there for those who really want to dig in. But for us, I'm just going to give you the summary this evening. What chapter 36 is going to do, it's going to wrap up the life of Esau, put a close to his whole family line before we move on to the life of Joseph. It's going to lay out the whole future bloodline of Esau. And what the Bible wants us to see in that is that Esau, this picture of the one who despises God, rebels against God, this picture of the flesh is going to produce in his family line 
some of the most heinous enemies of the people of God, the Israelites, who are going to show up as the villains and the wicked, evil people groups throughout the Old Testament. But also this lineage is going to show us that over history, in time, the Edomites, all the people who come from Esau, a picture of the flesh, are going to come to nothing. They're all going to be destroyed. And over the course of history, they're going to be completely wiped out. They're going to come to nothing because all works of the flesh, all things that aren't done for the Lord, ultimately come to nothing. And so next week, we're going to pick up chapter 37. I encourage you, read ahead. Read through the life of Joseph. Start getting into that. You're going to be so blessed by that. It's going to be a rich and rewarding study for us. So kind of a a weird chapter this evening again, but some good practical stuff. If one thing, the advice is this, stay in Bethel. When you know where God wants you to be, stay there. There are so many believers, people who love the Lord, who find Bethel. And then they leave because it looks like there's a better opportunity somewhere else. A better job, more money, a better situation. And I just want to encourage you that in life there is nothing that is worth more. Nothing that is worth more than knowing where God has called you to be and being there. Nothing. It's the place of blessing. There's nowhere better for your family to be, your kids to be. There's nowhere better for you to be if you're married. If you're single, there's nowhere better for you to be than in Bethel, the place that God has called you to be. And if you step out of that and and, and go your own way, you're going to experience tragedy. You are, because you're leaving the place of blessing. So serve the Lord in Bethel. Get involved in Bethel. Dwell in Bethel. And if you're coming back to the Lord, let me encourage you, just, just remember his faithfulness. Actually, all of us this evening, take some time as we take communion to remember the faithfulness of God and just thank him for his faithfulness. It's the best way to build faith in the here and now. And then lastly, just remember that if you belong to the Lord, he, he'll never condemn you, ever. He'll never condemn you. And if you need healing and comforting from things that have happened in the past, he's there to help you deal with that. Just ask him for healing. Ask him to do some work on your heart and your mind and your spirit, and and he will. So with that, would you bow your head and close your eyes and let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the advice and the counsel of your word. Thank you so much for the invitation to stay where you've called us to be. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here who, who doesn't know where their Bethel is, that, Lord, you would reveal it to them, that, God, you would make it absolutely clear where you want them to be. And if you're here this evening and you've never given your life to the Lord, I want to invite you to do that, to begin a relationship with Jesus. If you just have one taste of him, man, you're going to understand that he's better than anything else. And if you want to begin that relationship, just check the box on the back of your connection card tonight and turn that into us. Let me know before you leave. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to sit down and just talk with you for a minute about it and pray with you. Father, thank you so much again for your faithfulness. Thank you that you never condemn us. Thank you that you never bring up our past failures, but you paid for them and covered them. And you're always interested in moving us forward and calling us higher, God. Thank you that that's our trajectory that as Our bodies decay and fade, Lord. The reality is that while our physical may be trending down, Lord, our eternity is is trending up and we are moving closer and closer to being remade in your image, becoming more like you and experiencing eternity with you, God. Thank you that you're always doing your work in us. Just help us to welcome it. Help us to receive it, Lord. We're so grateful for it, Jesus.